Okay, question 10. This question looks at a function x to the x, which is an unusual one. It's certainly not a, a taught one in the course, but the methods we're going to use here initially are, are all about over and under estimates to find uh, some approximation for the area under the curve. So whilst we don't need to be able to integrate it, we just need to work with the function substitutions. They've drawn the estimates, and now we have to calculate that to five significant figures, so with a bit of accuracy. So I'm going to start with a statement again. It's two marks, so I want to show some working here. So I'd probably write this down just to be confident that I wasn't going to lose too much if I make a mistake. So those are the function values using the values at 1, 1.5, 2, and 2.5. And, and evaluation-wise, that's, um, that's what I need to calculate. I'm not doing 2 squared is 4 uh, on my calculator. I've come this far in the exam, I, I'm going to trust myself. And there's my value with all its decimal place glory, and we wanted 5 significant figures. So that's equal to 8.3596. Okay, beautiful. Uh, we could maybe write here, uh, units squared, because there's an area calculation, just in case those units were, were called for. All right, the last, the next part says, and you can't quite see on my screen, I'll just scroll that up. On the set of axes in figure 10 above, draw, add four rectangles of equal width that could be used to do an overestimate of that same area. So, um, let me have a scroll back a little bit and draw some rectangles. So the overestimate rectangles will capture the curve and some area below it and some area above it. And so I'm going to make sure I draw complete rectangles. And this one's going to be the one that needs an extra side to it. So it's going to be up to here and across. And I don't need to, I mean, maybe a ruler would have been wise, but it's pretty hard to use a ruler on a, on a, uh, a, a tablet like I'm using. So I'm going to have to freehand draw that. Uh, perhaps with a, with a ruler at hand, you could have done that with a ruler. Okay, but I think those rectangles uh, give the idea. Okay, uh, now we're asked um, to look at the uh, second derivative of this function. But interestingly, we, we don't normally have to know how to differentiate this, but we're given the first derivative. So we're going to have to start with that and say, okay, we want to differentiate the first derivative. So f dashed x is x to the x by ln x plus 1. And we're going to use product rule. So the first part of product rule is differentiate x to the x, which we wouldn't normally know how to do, but we are given that same expression. So it's going to be x to the x by ln x plus 1. That's the first part, that f dash part of the product rule. Multiplied by g, which is the ln x plus 1 part. Then we're going to have a positive uh, sign, and then we're going to have f, which is x to the x, and then g dashed will be the derivative of ln x plus 1, which is going to be 1 on x plus 0, which is just 1 on x. And a little bit of cleaning up here. I think that's a wise. With that in tow, I can now tackle c part 2, which is to show that this function is always convex or is always concave up. And that means that we need to show that the second derivative is positive, is always positive. So let's start with the fact that as x is greater than 0, what are the components of f dashed x? We know that if you take a positive number to a positive power, you're going to get a positive result. So we know that's a fact. We also know that um, x to the x over x, so that same term divided by a positive number will be positive. And we also know, in fact, it's always true, that ln x plus 1 all squared is greater than 0. So we can confidently say that x to the x, which is positive, times by ln x plus 1 all squared, which is positive, plus another positive thing, x to the x on x, that must be all greater than 0. 
Therefore, f double dashed x is greater than zero, which means that it is convex. So the sign of the second derivative is our test for that con convexity or, or concave up status of the graph. So that's um, that, and that confirms what we saw in the graph on the page before. Now, we're going to use this idea to decide whether the underestimate or the overestimate is a more accurate um, measure of the graph, and that's going to be based on that convex shape. So a little diagram here might be helpful. In fact, a little diagram here might tell you all you need to know. Think about the rectangles that we drew. This is the underestimate represented by that lower boundary. This is the overestimate represented by that upper boundary. This is basically halfway. And the fact is that this graph, because of its uh, convex status, this is closer. And this is further away. So if you think about it, the graph is sort of being pulled down like a sort of a bow and arrow away from that halfway mark. Um, now, I think that diagram tells the story. They say a picture tells a thousand words, but I'll try and put that into words as well. So it's important to state your decision because you had to decide which is more accurate. So I'm going to say the underestimate is more accurate. And then the reason which is going to try and describe that diagram is as follows. I think that sums up this uh, relationship reasonably well. Okay, question 11, which is the last question of the exam. So this is an uh, exciting moment. We're uh, entering the home stretch. Okay, this question looks like it's uh, focusing on the progress bars on a computer. I think something I'm sure that most of us are familiar with. And um, we're getting a lot of information there that we're going to have to digest. So I'll have a quick, quick look through it there. So this is about the idea of a perceived completion time. And it seems to be affected by the changes in the speed of a progress bar, whether it goes quickly, then slowly, or slowly, then quickly, and those, those sorts of things. So the, uh, the data this question is drawing on looks like it's talking about two different 30-second tasks uh, that both take uh, an accurate representation um, of a task from 0% to 100%, but one operates in a bar that speeds up during the 30 seconds. And they are predicting that the perceived time will be shorter than 30. Um, so in other words, it'll feel quicker than it actually is. And the test for this was 100 users, and they were asked to estimate perceived, some sort of perce perception of, of time taken. And the, uh, the value we have here is x bar equals 29.2 seconds, just a little bit less than 30. Um, so we're going to do a confidence interval for the mean perceived time um, based on that sample of, of 100 users. Um, we've got a sample, a population standard deviation of uh, 7.6. So it's back to stat mode we go. And we have a look at the interval section where we want a one sample interval. Uh, this one is a 95% interval, so we'll change that to 95%, 0.95. The standard deviation we were given was 7.6, and the uh, X bar value was 29.2, and the uh, number of people in the sample was 100. So there's our interval. So with an interval like this, we're now asked to say, can the researcher's prediction be supported with 95% confidence, recalling that their prediction was that it would be shorter. It would be uh, perceived to be shorter than the actual completion time, which was 30. And this interval doesn't allow us to conclude that because the interval, um, for, if, if it was true that the mean perception time was less than 30, that whole interval should lie below 30. Um, as it is, some of the interval is below 30, but some is above, and some is 30, so we can't conclude their result. So I'm going to uh, phrase that in the following way. So 
I'm going to start with a clear decision, uh, yes or no. I'm going to start with no. Um, I'm thinking that's going to earn me uh, some credit. And then we're talking about the prediction and can it be supported. So I'm going to steal some of that language and say the prediction is not supported. And then I'm going to talk about the confidence interval. So that's the idea that the mean uh, perceived level could be under, but it could be over or it could be 30. In other words, um, we, uh, we can't support a prediction that it isn't less than 30. Okay, now we look at a second task bar. Um, this one pauses momentar momentarily during the 30 second period. And the prediction here is that this will be perceived to be more than 10% longer than the actual completion time. And this time we're given a confidence interval and we're asked to, um, to give some evidence about that prediction of feeling slower. So um, first of all, we need to think about that 10% idea. So the prediction of the received completion time being more than 10% larger equates to a mu value of 10% more than 30, which is 33. And then the question is, how does 33 compare to that confidence interval? Uh, that interval lies wholly above um, 33 so that means that we can conclude that the perception was that it was more than 10% slower because the entire interval it contains values only that are more than 10% greater than 30 uh, so that's the uh, that's the angle I'm going to take on my answer So I think the key idea here is the interval is wholly above 33. So there's my second set of interpretations. Uh, now, interestingly, the question uh, pivots to show us some functions that were used to generate these task bars in the in the uh, sample that was done. Um, and now we're going to do some of the, uh, the math sitting behind that. So the first of all, uh, we have a function for the speed of the taskbar, the rate of change of that percentage complete. Uh, in other words, it's a derivative function. t dashed a of t is the square root of 30t on 6. And we want an integral expression for the percentage complete after 15 seconds. So that would be the total change in t from 0 to 15. In other words, it would be the definite integral from 0 to 15 of root 30t on 6 um, dt. And now we need to hence determine the percentage. It's worth one mark. I've got no uh, indication as to method, so I'm going to use my calculator here. Uh, go to the run matrix mode, and I want that uh, integration template again. This one's going to be the square root of 30t. Make sure the, the t is underneath, 30x in this case, um, over 6. And that's going to be uh, integrated from 0 to 15. And we get 35.36. So 35.4 to three significant figures. So I guess the interesting thing about that is it's halfway through the time, but it's not halfway through the percentage. Now we're looking at the um, the t dashed b which is the rate of change of the percentage complete bar for that second one the one that pauses part way through that people felt were taking a long time and we're told it pauses just the once and we need to show that the only value for this is um, b equals pi on 24 and this is uh, getting into the um, the pointy end of the question last page now um, so we're going to start with uh, setting that uh, function equal to zero. So now we've set this derivative function to zero, I'm going to rearrange and solve using some trigonometric thinking. So we're really asking when is a cosine function equal to minus one? 
So remembering the unit circle and the cosine is the x coordinate, that's asking it's when is it there. And we know it's only there the one time, um, but in general this equation has multiple solutions. It has solutions at pi or 3 pi or 5 pi or 7 pi or in general k lots of 2 pi. That means that t is equal to pi over b plus k lots of 2 pi over b. Now, as this is only one solution, it must be the first one, which is pi over b. So there's the solution that we uh, expected to find. The other solutions will be outside of the domain 0 to 30. So now we have an exact B value, we now need an exact A value, and the extra information we're given is that task B is completed in 30 seconds. So we're going to use the integral from 0 to 30 and the B value um, to find the value for A. That definite integral will be equal to 100 because it's the 100% being the completion of the task bar. So the integral of a, of a cosine function will be a sine function, so it's going to be a sine pi on 24t multiplied by 24 on pi plus a of t, and that's from 0 to 30. Now that bound substitution is next. I'm going to take out the A coefficient from the whole thing because there's an A in, as part of every one of these terms. Now to progress my solution I need a couple of exact uh, values, uh, sine 0 is zero, that's going to be helpful, but sine of 30 pi on 24, uh, something the calculator might be able to help me with. This is where you definitely need to make sure your calculator is in radians if you hadn't already set it to be so. So that's negative root 2 over 2, familiar value there. So now what is required is to try and clean this up a little bit so I get a equals 2. I'm going to simplify my fraction where I can. And I'm going to um, essentially divide the coefficient of a to the other side. So a will be equal to 100 divided by 30 minus 12 root 2 on pi. Or if I wanted to be... Um, particular about it, I might times through by pi and say that's 100 pi over 30 pi minus 12 root 2. Okay, so that's the end of the exam, and if you're out of time, it's time to hand those booklets up.